Good morning, Grace. Uh, my name is Colin Strong. And if you would open to 1 Samuel uh, 4, 1 to 11 for the reading this morning. 1 Samuel 4, 1 to 11, please. <clears throat> and the word of Samuel came to all Israel. Now Israel went out to battle against the Philistines. They camped to Ebenezer, and the Philistines encamped to Aphek. The Philistines drew up in line against Israel. And then when the battle spread, Israel was de defeated before the Philistines, who killed about 4,000 men on the field of battle. When the people came to the camp, the elders of Israel said, Why has the Lord defeated us today before the Philistines? Let us bring the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord here from Shiloh, that it may come among us and save us from the power of our enemies. So the people sent to Shiloh and brought from there the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of hosts, who was enthroned on the cherubim. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were there with the Ark of the Covenant of God. As soon as the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord came into the camp, all Israel gave a mighty shout, so that the earth resounded. And when the Philistines heard the noise of the shouting, they said, What does this great shouting in the camp of the Hebrews mean? And when they learned that the Ark of the Lord had come to the camp, the Philistines were afraid, for they said, A God has come into the camp. And they said, Woe to us, for nothing like this has happened before. Woe to us, who can deliver us from the power of these mighty gods? These are the gods who struck the, the Egyptians with every sort of plague in the wilderness. Take courage and be men, O Philistines, lest you become slaves to the Hebrews as they have been to you. Be men and fight. So the Philistines fought Israel. The, so the Philistines fought and Israel was defeated and they fled. Every man to his home and there was a very great slaughter. For uh, 30,000 foot soldiers of Israel fell. The ark of God was captured, and the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, died. Thank you, Colin. All right, let's come to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you for this morning, Lord. I want to thank you that for each of us in this room, Lord, we have an opportunity and an ability to know the living hope. Lord, this world... There are so many things happening that just seem dark and evil. That you have given us a living hope, a light, Lord, that outshines the darkness, that destroys the darkness. God, I pray that for us this morning, as we dive into your word, God, that we would see this light, that we would leave encouraged, challenged, and convicted, and most of all, Father, drawn closer to you. God, we love you, and we thank you for this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Pastor Andreas Bailey. I see a lot of new faces, some people I haven't met yet, and it's an honor and privilege to be with you this morning. We're in a series called Yahweh is King. We're going through the books of Samuel. And Pastor Steve last week talked about how the Word of God does the work of God. Unfortunately, we had some technical difficulties, so you can't go back and watch it. But just trust me that it was really good. It was really good. Hopefully, we're not going to have any of that today. <laughs> but it was really good. Uh, he encouraged us that the Word of God is living and active. So to this morning, we're going to be in 1 Samuel chapter 4. 1 Samuel chapter 4, so I'll let you turn there real quick. But as you turn there, I read a story this week about a businessman who needed millions of dollars to clinch a deal. So what does this businessman do? He goes to church. He wasn't a frequent church goer. He decides, you know, I'll go to church and I'll pray. I'll pray that God gives me this couple million dollars that I need to clinch this business deal. So he goes to church and he's praying. And there's a gentleman in the pew next to him praying. And this gentleman is praying for $100 to take care of a debt that he owed. And the, gentleman, the businessman overhears him, and he decides, well, I have $100 in my wallet right now. He pulls out the $100. As the man's praying, he puts it in the other man's hand, and he presses it hard. The, the man is overjoyed. My debt is, I, have, I have money to pay my debt now. And the businessman then closes his eyes and continues to pray to God, and he says, God... Now that I have your undivided attention, what about that couple million dollars that I need to clinch this business deal? See, I think for some of us, 
we do that exact same thing. Do we not? We may not need a couple million dollars, even though that may be nice. But we try to manipulate God. We try to twist his arm in order that we can get what we want. And we're going to see that in our passage today with the Israelites. So open up your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 4. This morning we will see how the Israelites try to manipulate God into giving them victory over the Philistines. So let's open up our Bibles. Let's turn there. This section is, is known as the Ark of the Covenant, or the, the Ark Narrative. So you have chapters 4 to chapter 7. It's called the Ark Narrative. And so really it's a story about how the Ark gets stolen and how the Ark eventually ends up back in the hands of the Israelites. And so we're starting in chapter 4. Chapter 4 is the start of the Ark Narrative. Some of you may know what the Ark is. Some of you may not. What, the Ark is basically a... a a, a wooden box and it was about a little smaller than four feet long it was covered in gold and on top there were two angels two kind of angel statues and this was the visible presence of God for the, pre, the people of Israel in the ark the, the, the interesting thing about it is it would carry the, the ten commandment tablets from Mount Sinai it would also carry Aaron's rod and so as we dive into this passage bear that in mind that the ark is important in this passage. It's mentioned 12 times in chapter 4. When something is mentioned 12 times, it's important, man. It's something that we need to take note of, all right? So we're going to dive in here. Also remember two different people groups. You have the Philistines and you have the Israelites. So we're going to start reading at verse 1 and we're going to go to verse 4. Verse 1 says, And the word of Samuel came to all Israel. Now Israel went out to battle against the Philistines. They encamped at Ebenezer, and the Philistines encamped at Ahok. The Philistines drew up in line against Israel, and when the battle spread, Israel was defeated before the Philistines, who killed about 4,000 men on the field of battle. And when the people came to the camp, the elders of Israel said, Why has the Lord defeated us today before the Philistines? Let us bring the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord from Shiloh, that it may come among us and save us from the power of our enemies. So the people sent to Shiloh and brought from there the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of Hosts, who is enthroned on the cherubim. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were there with the Ark of the Covenant of God. We're going to see Israel make some missteps. That's what we're going to call missteps. They're going to be walking, and they're going to be looking really good, and oh, they're going to be tripping. That's what I'm going to call this, Israel's missteps. So we see Israel make a couple of missteps. In verse 3, we have the elders of Israel, and they ask a great question. They ask the right question. What do they say in verse 3? They say, why has the Lord defeated us today before the Philistines? This is a great question. They're simply asking God, God, why are you allowing judgment to come upon your people? Why, Lord? For us, we, many of us in this room, we have been in trials and difficulties, and we've asked the same question. Brothers and sisters, it's a good question to ask, and you should ask that type of question. I think back to the story of Job. Job is asking why several times, and he's, he was a righteous man. So asking God why is a difficulty happening, it's a good question. You should ask that question. But I want us to take note. Look what Israel does. Look how they respond. Look how the elders of Israel respond. Catch this. In verse 4, it says, Let us bring the ark of the covenant of the Lord here from Shiloh, that it, underline it, if you have your Bibles out, underline that word, circle it. It says that it may come among us and save us from the power of our enemies. Have you ever asked God a question, and you were like, you know, God's not getting back to me right now. Um, I'm going to go do my own thing. I'm going to take it into my own hands. This is what the Israelites are doing. They're taking it into their own hands. They think back to Joshua chapter 6, where the Israelites are, are going around the, the city of Jericho, the walls of Jericho, and they're thinking back, okay, what, what worked for those individuals? Well, they had the ark with them. Maybe that's what we need to do. 
So they respond wrongly. They're too quick. We need to be patient. As brothers and sisters in Christ, we need to be patient to wait on God sometimes. Sometimes we try to take things into our own hands too quickly. We need to wait on God. Patience is a necessity. So my dad would always tell me, we'd be at a yard sale or a flea market, and I'd be like, Dad, this line is way too long. He said, Dre, patience is a necessity. You need patience. Sometimes that is how it is with God. We need patience. And then we get to the third misstep they have. Superstition, not faith. And we see this going on even further in verse 4 where it said that it may come among us. I asked you to circle that word, it. They're taking the ark, and what they're simply doing is they're making it a good luck charm. They're making it their rabbit's foot. They're making it their four-leaf clover. You name it. They're making it their good luck charm. This is a sad thing. See, they think that back in Joshua chapter 6, where Joshua had the ark with them, they think, okay, that, that brought them victory then. It will for sure do that for us now, because God, God doesn't want to lose a battle, because that makes Yahweh, it makes God look bad. So God will for sure give us victory if we bring the visible presence of God into battle with us. What they're really doing is they're manipulating God. They're kind of trying to put God into a corner, and they're saying, God, you can't lose this battle because your visible presence is with us. The ark is with us. They're full of superstition, not faith. What they should be doing in that moment is having faith that God will give them victory in this battle. But they're full of superstition. And then we get to some bad company. Y'all ever been around bad company? Well, unfortunately, the ark of God was around bad company. We remember in 1 Samuel chapter 3, Hophni and Phinehas, right? What happened? Samuel goes uh, to, to Eli several times, and he thinks that God, well, he thinks that Eli's calling, but in reality, God is calling him. And God is like, hey, there's some bad stuff going to be happening to Hophni and Phinehas into the house of Eli because they are disobeying me. They are living in sin. They are not living the way they ought to. And so Hophni and Phinehas, this is some bad company. All I hear is that ominous music, like, ominous music, like, oh, oh, like, I don't know. Y'all know what I'm saying? Like, you know, like in a horror movie, that's all I'm hearing because all I know is that Hop and I and Phineas are about to die, right? And we know that they're with the ark. So we just, like, you know, in a movie, you know, like something's about to happen. Something's about to happen right here, y'all. Hop and I and Phineas are bad dudes, okay? And so then uh, I want to remind us in 1 Samuel chapter 3 where it said, uh, God said, I declare to him that I'm about to punish his house, this is Eli's house, forever, for the iniquity that he knew because his sons were blaspheming God, and he did not restrain them. Therefore I swear to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be atoned for by sacrifice or by offering forever. So we see Israel's missteps, right? We see they do, they do a good thing, they ask the right question, but they have the wrong response. And then we see how they, they are, they're full of superstition and not faith. And then lastly, how they have bad company around the ark, Hophni and Phinehas. Well, let's see what the results of that is going to be. Let's see what the result's going to be. So let's jump into verse 5 of chapter 4. Verse 5 of chapter 4, it says, As soon as the ark of the covenant of the Lord came into the camp, all Israel gave a mighty shout so that the earth resounded. Verse 6 says, And when the Philistines heard the noise of the shouting, they said, What does this great shouting in the camp of the Hebrews mean? And when they learned that the ark of the Lord had come to the camp, the Philistines were afraid. For they said, A God has come into the camp. And they said, Woe to us, for nothing like this has happened before. Woe to us, who can deliver us from the power of these mighty gods? These are the gods who struck the Egyptians with every sort of plague in the wilderness. 
Take courage and be men, O Philistines. Least you become slaves to the Hebrews as they have been to you. Be men and fight. So the Philistines fought, and Israel was defeated, and they fled every man to his home, and there was a very great slaughter, for 30,000 foot soldiers of Israel fell. And the ark of God was captured. And to no surprise, the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, are dead. What are the results of Israel's missteps? Well, the first one is a sense of false confidence. And we see this when they're shouting. They, it's, the pastor says they have a mighty roar, like a mighty shout. And I, I believe they're getting this again from Joshua chapter 6, where if, if we remember on the seventh day, what does Joshua tell them? He says, bring the ark with you. And then when you shout, the walls of Jericho will fall. And so they're shouting now in 1 Samuel 4. They're shouting. They're giving what some may call a war cry. And who hears them? The Philistines. How do the Philistines respond? Respond a little fearful. It says they're afraid. The Philistines are afraid. So I believe that the Israelites have this false sense of confidence. And it leads to the effects on the Philistines. The ark affects the Philistines. And we see the Philistines are afraid. But I want us to catch this. I truly believe that the Philistines in this moment are honoring God, Yahweh, more than the Israelites themselves. And they don't even believe in Yahweh. Why do I say that? Because the passage says that they're afraid, right? It says that they've heard of all of these things that the Israelites God has done. They struck down the Egyptians with every sort of plague in the wilderness. Uh, you know, all these things. They're, they're saying, woe to us. Like they know in their minds that they're about to be destroyed because Yahweh is with the people of Israel. But that false sense of confidence the Israelites have, and then you take the Philistines being a little fearful, the complete opposite happens. The complete opposite happens. The Israelites are shouting. They have this war cry. They think they're going to win. The Philistines are fearful. But in, in, in verse, let's see here, verse 9, it says, the Philistines, take courage and be men, O Philistines. Least you become slaves to the Hebrews as they have been to you. Be men and fight. The Philistines are jacked up now. They're ready to go to battle. They're ready to wipe out every Israelite. They're ready. They're not fearful anymore. It leads to that false confidence the Israelites have. The ark affected the, the Philistines. And then, the end result of it is the Israelites lose the battle. They had a false sense of confidence. They thought by, by bringing this good luck charm in their minds, by twisting God's arm, by trying to manipulate him, they would gain victory. Brothers and sisters, we can read that that's not what happened. They didn't get victory. They lost 30,000 foot soldiers. Earlier in the passage, they lost 4,000. 4,000 compared to 30,000 is nothing. 30,000 is a big impact in the army. Not only that, they lost one of the most precious things that they have. The visible display of who God is, the ark. They lost the ark. They lose it. It's stolen by the Philistines. The Philistines are victorious. It's interesting to see how God is, God is like, hey, you know, you thought, you thought for a moment that by letting me lose this, this battle, like put, bringing the ark into its place, bringing the ark into battle, you thought that I would, in a sense, feel like, you, you know, I can't lose this battle. But God's saying, you know what's worse than that? The fact that my people are living in sin. God kind of puts his honor to the side and he's like what matters most is the fact that you Israelites are living in sin and you need to be judged there needs to be judgment and so God through this he judges the Israelites he judges them and we get into this next half of the passage in, in verse 12 it's kind of like uh, the end of an era I'll call it the end of an era but before we get there I just I want us to understand that we cannot manipulate God. We cannot manipulate Him. But what we can do is we can trust that He knows 
best. I wonder what the Israelites were thinking at this point, that the fact that they lost 30,000 foot soldiers. They were probably fearful and scared. When we're facing a trial or, or a difficulty, or where we feel like God's judging us, we need to understand that we cannot manipulate him to try to make him do what are pleasing, but that we need to trust that he knows best. So this leads to, to verse 12. I'm going to call it the end of an era. Verse 12 says, And a man of Benjamin ran from the battle line and came to Shiloh the same day, with his clothes torn with dirt on his head. When he arrived, Eli was sitting on his seat by the road watching, for his heart trembled for the ark of God. And when the man came into the city and told the news, all the city cried out. When Eli heard the sound of the outcry, he said, What is this uproar? Then the man hurried and came and told Eli. Now Eli was 98 years old, and his eyes were set so that he could not see. And the man said to Eli, I am he who has come from the battle. I fled from the battle today. And he said, How did it go, my son? He who brought the news answered and said, Israel has fled before the Philistines, and there has also been a great defeat among the people. Your two sons, also Hophni and Phinehas, are dead, and the ark of God has been captured. As soon, catch this, as soon as he mentioned the ark of God, Eli fell over backward from his seat by the side of the gate, and his no neck was broken, and he died. For the man was old and heavy, and he judged Israel for 40 years. I think some of us, when we read that passage, we just laugh. I, I don't know if it's just the fact that Eli's a heavy guy, and he literally tips over and dies. I don't know. We, I, first time I read this part of the passage, I laughed. I know I did. But there's nothing funny happening in this passage. What you have is God's judgment against the house of Eli coming to the peak. And we see that Eli was waiting for this news concerning the battle in verse 13. It says, When he arrived, Eli was sitting on a seat by the road watching, for his heart trembled for the ark of God. And when the man came to the city, he told the news, and all the city cried out. Eli was waiting. I tend to think that he probably knew what was going to happen. He probably knew. He knew that God's judgment was coming towards him and his house. Samuel told him that. So he's sitting there, and this Benjamite comes in. He's filthy, dirty from head to toe. He's coming in from the battle, and, and the whole city is erupting because they're hearing what the Benjamite's telling them. And Eli, the one thing that he's most concerned about it's not, hey, did the Israelites win the battle? It's not, how, how is Hophni? It's not, how is Phinehas doing? He's concerned about the Ark of God, the Ark of the Covenant. It says, as soon as he mentioned the Ark of God, Eli fell over backward from his seat by the side of the gate. As soon as he told him, as soon as he mentioned it, that was Eli's biggest concern. We need to ask ourselves, what is the biggest concern in our lives? What are we concerned about most in life? All right, let me, we get to this start of a new era in verse 19 to 22. This is an interesting way to end the passage. It says in verse 19, now his daughter-in-law, so this is Eli's daughter-in-law, this is the wife of Phineas, was pregnant about to give birth. And when she heard the news that the ark of God was captured and that her father-in-law and her husband were dead, she bowed and gave birth, for her pains came upon her. And about the time of her death, the woman attending her said to her, Do not be afraid, for you have, a, you have born a son. For you have born a son. Let's see here. But she did not answer or pay attention. And she named the child Ichabod, saying, The glory has departed from Israel, because the ark of God had been captured, and because of her father-in-law and her husband. And she said, The glory has departed from Israel, for the ark of God has been captured. 
So you ha- here you have Phineas' wife. She's pregnant, and she hears the news. And she goes right like a premature labor, man. She hears the news, and it, it leads to premature labor. And you can tell, again, what is her biggest concern? It's not the fact that her father-in-law passed away. It's not that her brother-in-law passed away. It's not even the fact that her husband passed away. Her biggest concern is the Ark of the Covenant. What, what happened to the Ark? And we read how, how do, you can kind of sense in, in what she's saying and, and in her attitude in this passage, it's, she's, she's scared, she's fearful, she's worried for the people of Israel. So she gives birth to this son and, and names him Ichabod, and it means no glory, or the glory has departed, because now the ark is in the hands of the Philistines. To her, God seems distant. To her, God seems to have kind of left the picture. But let me tell you, the Ark of the Covenant was a visible sign of God's presence, but we know that Scripture points to the fact that God is omnipresent, that He is here right now in this room. He is with us at all times. So God never, in my opinion, never, and from Scripture, never really left the Israelites. He was always with them. He was always watching over them. But the visible sign of God, the ark, was taken and stolen. So has there been a time in your life where you've felt distant from God? Maybe a time in your life where you've felt, God, where are you at? Well, I want to encourage you with Zechariah verse 1, or chapter 1, verse 3. Zechariah chapter 1, verse 3. It says, return to me, declares the Lord of hosts, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. This is what God is saying to the Israelites in this passage. He's saying, return to me. Turn away from your sin. Repent of your sin. You are not living the life you were called to live. And I will return to you. Jeremiah 29, verses 12 to 14 says this. Jeremiah 29, verses 12 to 14, it says, Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me, When you seek me with all of your heart, I will be found by you, declares the Lord. I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I have driven you, declares the Lord. I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. If you find yourself in a place where you feel distant from God, I think one of the first things we need to do is we need to to kind of look at the mirror. Is there a struggle in my life, a sin struggle that I need to confront? that I need to repent of and turn away from because we see that in the Israelites' life, in the Israelites, as, the, as, as God is calling out the house of Eli for their sin. God never left the house of Eli. He never left these individuals. But he's saying, hey, you got sin in your life that you need to repent and turn away from because it's gonna lead to destruction. He wants us to seek him with all of our heart. James 4 8 says, Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. I love how ha- uh, Phineas' wife names her child Ichabod. Basically means no glory. But what does Ichabod point to? It points to Emmanuel. Emmanuel, Jesus Christ, God with us. Amen. Points to Emmanuel. The fact that Jesus Christ came in the form of a man to an earth full of sinners, a broken world, and that he wanted us to make us right with God again, to have that relationship with him. We see this cycle in the Israelites in the Old Testament where they they fall into sin, and then God has to restore them. They fall into sin, God has to restore them over and over again. But this time, God sends Emmanuel, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, in order to make us right with him his one and perfect son. I want to leave us with some, well, this is a big idea. We cannot manipulate God, but we can trust that he knows best. But I want to leave us with some, some things that we can take and, and apply to our lives. As 24-7 worshipers, that is, is as a believer all throughout the week, what can we be doing? We can seek God with all of our hearts. Don't, 
don't just try to seek God with a little bit of who you are. Try to seek him with everything that you have. As go people, as go persons, what can we do? Unlike the Benjamite who came, he was sharing bad news, the fact that the Israelites lost. We need to share joy-filled news, and that is the news of Jesus Christ, his death and his resurrection, and the fact that it gives us life. And as alongsiders, we need to confront manipulation in fellow believers or in others. Some of us, we don't like that word confront. But as believers and brothers and sisters looking out for one another, that's what we need to do. We need to confront one another. If we, see, if we see a brother or sister trying to manipulate God or trying to twist his arm, trying to make him do our bidding, so to say, we need to confront that individual. We need to be honest with that individual and say, hey, what you're doing is kind of like what the Israelites were doing in, in 1 Samuel chapter 4. And we know what the end result of that was. Nothing good, right? Throughout this week, I've I never personally thought that I would ever spend a week in 1 Samuel chapter 4. You know? It's not a chapter where you're like, hey, I'm going to spend a week on this whole passage and kind of dive into it. But God showed me a lot, and he grew me through this passage. And I hope that as you you go home this week, read 1 Samuel 4. Read it maybe for the rest of the week, every day, once a day. But I was encouraged by this quote that I came across by J.D. Gear. He said, quit trying to manipulate God into acting how you think he should. Start trusting him to act how he knows is best. We need to quit trying to manipulate God, trying to have him do our bidding, and we need to trust that he knows what's best for each and every single one of us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the story within 1 Samuel chapter 4 and as we've been able to dive into the ark narrative a little bit. God, I pray for each of us, Lord. There's some of us in this room, Lord, including myself at times, where we have tried to twist your arm. We have tried to trick you. We have tried to manipulate you in order to get what we wanted. We find ourselves as that businessman was, doing maybe a good deed and looking to you saying, God, now that I have your undivided attention. Lord, I pray that we would come to you, Lord, with humble hearts, that we would not be self-seeking or self-focused, but that we would be selfless, knowing, Father, that you know exactly what is best for each and every single one of us. God, help us. Forgive us for trying to manipulate you. Restore us, show us the way. We love you in Jesus' name, amen.